There's a term that's become a bit overused when discussing comedies from the 70s and 80s, saying a movie, quote, couldn't be made today. This mostly refers to comedies with edgy material, such as Blazing Saddles, which is ridiculous as movies like Blazing Saddles could absolutely be made today, we just need filmmakers with the guts to do it. But I digress. Do you know what I feel was a movie that could not be made today, though? Pee-wee's Big Adventure. Nobody hit me to that, dude. I just can't imagine a major film studio today giving a comedian, known for an HBO special and appearances on late night TV, his very own movie. Warner Brothers thinks your story would make a fantastic movie. My story? A movie? Allowing him to write the script, despite never having written one, as well as allowing him to choose the director, albeit one who had never directed a feature film before, then giving them $7 million and the creative freedom to make whatever the hell kind of movie they wanted to make. I love that story. <laughs> and trusting Paul Rubens, Tim Burton, and their crew, Warner Brothers gave PB's Big Adventure the opportunity to become a surreal cultural sensation that has entertained audiences for decades. I meant to do that. But as the key creative team was making their very first feature film, the production of Pee-wee's Big Adventure would be a learning experience for most involved. Writers Phil Hartman, Michael Varhol, and Paul Rubens used Sid Field's screenplay as a basis to write their script. I'd never written a movie before. I bought Sid Field's The Screenplay. And, <clears throat> and we did exactly what they said. And uh, it's a 90-minute film. It's a 90-page script. On page 30, I lose my bike. On page 60, I find it. I mean, it's, it's literally... It's literally exactly what they said to do in the book. The script for Peavy's Big Adventure also moves at such a quick pace, something that translates perfectly from page to screen. I know you are, but what am I? 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 Infinity! No, I'm not. You, you are. are. No, no way. way! Knock it, Knock it off. off! Cut it, Cut it out. out! No, shut, shut up, up. Peavy. Why don't you make me? Why don't you make me? Because! I don't make monkeys, I just trade them! The film quickly moves from one set piece to the next, and never leaves us as the audience bored. In order to achieve this though, scenes would have to be cut. <laughs> Explaining some of them may finally address things about the movie that you don't understand. Things you couldn't understand. Things you shouldn't understand. This is the lost version of Pee-Bee's Big Adventure. Let's begin, shall we? Shall we? Like I said, Peavy's Big Adventure does a great job in setting up jokes that will have a payoff later in the movie. For example, the scene at Mario's Magic Shop that occurs just 15 minutes in sets up jokes that will have payoffs throughout the movie. Trick gum. Okay. Uh... At the shop, Peavy buys three things. Trick gum, headlight glasses, and the boomerang bow tie. <laughs> now the gum is later used in the scene where Pee Wee dupes the Buxtons, and the headlight glasses after Mickey kicks him out of the car. What's those headlight glasses? <laughs> but what about the boomerang bow tie? And direct from Australia, the boomerang bow tie. Well, it turns out this bow tie was to play a major part later in the movie, during the studio chase scene where Pee-wee would have used it to evade security. The scene was actually filmed, and the work print footage has survived. It's a lot of fun to see the third Magic Shop purchase finally get used, but this scene would have definitely slowed the pace of the final chase, almost bringing it to a complete halt, so I'm glad it was ultimately left out. I'll say! I'm going to start a paper route right now! As written, this entire chase scene took on a much different structure. Originally, after being reunited with his bike, Peavy would have immediately entered a western street, and then a prop warehouse where he would have tried to hide his bike in a fake horse. Come on, boy. Come on. When he was caught trying to exit, then the big chase scene through all those different sound stages would have started. Another gag during the chase scene involved Pee-wee passing through a sound stage where an actress is arguing with the wardrobe department. 
Exterior soundstage street, day. An actress modeling a gown is yelling at a wardrobe woman. I want it sexier. As PB whizzes by, the gown gets hooked on his bike and tears off the actress's body, leaving her in her bra and panties. The other vehicles speed by. <laughs> Again, these are pretty wise omissions as they don't add much to this great set piece. Oh, come on! I'm listening to reason. Truly, some of the most unique scenes in the movie are the dark nightmare sequences. Originally, there were to be three of these in the movie. The dinosaur one, where Pee-wee's bike gets eaten, the clown one, where the bike is sent to hell, and another that would have taken place between the two of them. Shortly after, Pee-wee competes in the rodeo and is given the lift by an animal trainer and his pet bear, Boone. Don't mind old Boone. He just loves people. Pee-wee would then fall asleep during their trip and have a circus-themed nightmare that involved Francis costumed in a bear suit as Pee-wee tried to cross a tightrope. <laughs> Stop the car! I gotta find a telephone! Evidently, this scene stayed with Paul Rubens as he recycled most of it for Big Top Pee-wee a few years later. While we can view a rough edit of this scene today, it definitely pales in comparison to the other nightmare scenes. The sequence does provide a little backstory as to how Pee Wee goes from the rodeo to the biker bar, but offers little value beyond that. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. In the movie, after Pee Wee's accident, we see the Satan's helpers escorting him to the hospital. They would have shown up again later on, though, where they would have visited Pee-wee in his room. I got this little frog. Not very funny, but watch him when you turn him upside down. Hey, let me cheer him up. Yeah. <laughs> as much as I love these characters, their appearance here feels like they're overstaying their welcome, and the movie works much better without it. Now, there is one deleted scene from the movie that ultimately caused a chain reaction of other scenes to either be heavily trimmed or cut out completely. The backstory of Amazing Larry. Is this something you could share with the rest of us, Amazing Larry? As it stands, Amazing Larry doesn't even get a line of dialogue in the movie. But in just this little exchange, the character has become iconic in his own right, owed mostly to his unique hairstyle. Watching this movie as a kid, I just always assumed Amazing Lowry was an eccentric friend of Mario's. But a deleted scene reveals he was a lot more than that. Pee Wee Herman, meet Amazing Lowry! Hey, Amazing Lowry. How do you do? <laughs> Pee Wee would have first met Amazing Lowry at Mario's magic shop. It can be hard to tell who's even playing Amazing Lowry in the brief few seconds he appears on screen in the final cut. But here we can clearly see it's Lou Cutell a character actor with dozens of iconic appearances under his belt. Yeah, excuse me, um, you didn't by any chance just recently get the wrong license plates? Yes, I'm still waiting for the Motor Vehicle Bureau to straighten it out. So, you're the ass man. <laughs> we can even see how Tim Burton was able to work around cutting him out thanks to good coverage. My friend Pee-wee! <laughs> Hi, Mario! Hello, Pee-wee! <laughs> My good friend Pee-wee! Hi, Mario! <laughs> Amazing Larry, an illusionist, would have demonstrated his new closing trick for Pee Wee. Even more fitting, it was Pee-wee's suggestion that resulted in his more unique hairstyle later on. I just wish I could find a way to jazz it up a bit. Mm. Hey, Amazing Larry, look! A new hairstyle. An amazing idea. Thanks, Pee-wee. You amaze me. <laughs> Watching the movie, we don't even question why Pee-wee has a friend named Amazing Larry or why he has a crazy hairstyle. It just works. It's a testament to how perfectly Paul Rubens and Tim Burton set up this world and the characters in it. 
Listening to the DVD commentary, Paul Rubens himself even seemed to forget they filmed Amazing Lowry's backstory. The sequence you just mentioned that we cut out, wow, I forgot about that. Yeah. Can't you remember anything? I remember the Alamo. Yeah! It's really nice to see Lou Cutell's full performance, but this is a character that didn't need a backstory, as bizarre as it may be. Because this scene was cut, though, there were two more that had to be cut out as a result. Mario and Amazing Lowry would have been at the big movie premiere at the end of the movie. Exterior drive-in parking space is night. Pee-wee beams and moves past Mario and the Amazing Lowry, who are levitating a few feet off the ground as they watch the movie. Lowry has an even wilder hairdo, braided in the shape of a birdcage. Pee-wee, this movie is terrific. Amazing. You amaze me. <laughs> Even more surreal, Amazing Larry would have gotten a mention during the movie within the movie. Our contact in Geneva will be an agent, codenamed Amazing Larry. Check. I guess we'll... What's wrong, Pee-wee? Why the faraway look? I was just thinking how much I love this country. These scenes honestly would have just detracted from the legend that is Amazing Larry, and this small exchange in the final cut adds much more to his mystique than any of this cut content. Something you could share with the rest of us, Amazing Larry? Pee-wee's Big Adventure really is a unique example of a movie where plot holes and gaps in logic aren't even questioned by the audience because of how well Tim Burton and Paul Rubens set up Pee-wee's world and the characters in it. From the opening scene, we are shown that Pee-wee's world functions differently from our own, and each wacky turn that the movie takes us on is made all the more memorable as a result. Some sort of problem? No problem at all. I just wanted to take a quick look at that cute little outfit you have on. <laughs> Again, I have to give credit for Warner Brothers for trusting these filmmakers and allowing them to tell their story with minimal interference. While Sid Field's screenplay book guided Paul Rubens and his fellow writers in creating this story, even more can be learned today by simply watching this movie. It's a masterclass in setup and payoff. Everyone I know has a big butt. Come on, Simone, let's talk about your big butt. But also lays the beats for story structure in a way that's both entertaining and educational. I know you are, but what am I? It's something that Tim Burton was able to bring to the rest of his movies, as well as an element that has made Pee Wee Herman such an iconic character, and all the more reason why he will be missed so much. You amaze me. <laughs>